Aquaba, welcome to this video about a volunteer stint I did in Ghana in 2018. But first, by way of introduction, my name is Conrad Berube. I first became involved in international development as a Peace Corps volunteer in 1982 in Ecuador. I was assigned to the eastern coast of the country on the Santa Elena Peninsula, about three hours east of Guayaquil where I was assigned to a forestry project, but because of disastrous flooding attributable to the El Nino current, the forestry nursery at which I was supposed to work washed out to sea. So I began a secondary project in beekeeping, which became my primary focus. I thereafter became a Peace Corps technical trainer to train incoming volunteers in apiculture, and ultimately went back to school where I gained a master's in entomology with a focus on apiculture and integrated pest management. So, so far I've conducted beekeeping training in, besides Ecuador, Guatemala, Tunisia, Nepal, Guinea, Haiti, Uganda, and Ghana. And about half of those were projects that were funded by the Farmer to Farmer program. I mention this because most of my video output has revolved around beekeeping and most of my subscribers have an interest in beekeeping and probably not so much in integrated pest management so I didn't want them to be disappointed because the topic of this video is integrated pest management. So if you are interested in beekeeping you might want to check out one of the many how-to videos that I've already put up. But, of course, I'd invite you to stick around and maybe learn something about integrated pest management. The Farmer to Farmer program is funded by the United States Department of Agriculture and offers technical assistance to countries with which the U.S. has friendly diplomatic relationships in the form of professional volunteers who contribute their time in exchange for having a very interesting overseas experience. The intent of the program is that host country beneficiaries will have increased income through the education that they obtain and that the U.S. will benefit from higher quality agricultural imports through such things as reduced pesticide residues or reduced numbers of imported pests. The Farmer to Farmer F2F budget is jointly administered overseas by the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, and, in this case for Ghana, by the International Executive Service Corps, IESC, which is a non-government organization, NGO, and I hope that you are A-OK -okay with me simply using the acronyms from here on out. In a nutshell, the highly professional staff of IESC serves as a liaison between farmer to farmer volunteers and their host agency and clientele communities. They oversee the security and well being of the farmer to farmer volunteers and ensure that the training that the volunteers provide fits into a greater whole that addresses cohesively the needs of the Ghanaian client communities. Just to set the stage a bit, if you think of the silhouette of Africa as looking somewhat like a human skull, Ghana sits just about where the spine would enter the skull. And I was to work with three grower groups, one in the town of Bagro, and the other two in outlier communities. The first of which was called Dedesu. And the other was called Amokrom. All three are part of the eastern region of Ghana. Ghana 
is a land of contrasts, as illustrated by these road scenes. The infrastructure in Ghana segues from the vital cosmopolitan capital of Accra through picturesque bedroom communities. That gradually give way to rural market towns and eventually to relatively undeveloped agrarian villages. Amakrom is fairly typical of small rural communities and as you can tell uh, domestic animals and livestock are often allowed to roam freely. Dogs and sometimes pigs will uh, vacuum up a lot of the trash that accumulates around communities because most small villages lack any kind of community waste disposal infrastructure as is evident from the litter in these images. Although animals used to do a pretty good job of recycling organic wastes, plastics pollution is often more evident in these communities than in the developed world from which these products originate and the collection of which villages are ill-equipped to handle. As typical of many areas in Ghana, structures are made out of mud bricks, what amounts to essentially adobe, and are roofed here by zinc sheets, which have over recent decades come to replace the traditional thatched roofs, although thatched roofs are still evident in many locations. Omacrom and Desedu were both characterized by fairly flat terrain. And although the terrain of Begro was a bit more rolling, all three communities enjoy a generally savanna ecosystem with an extended dry period. Client growers hold relatively small parcels of land on which they grow a variety of produce, principally chili peppers, eggplants, lettuce, cabbage, okra, etc. Alright, well I think that's enough of a general background to give you some idea of what I was getting into, which was specifically to equip vegetable producer associations with the skills and knowledge required to carry out sound IPM practices to reduce crop losses through pest infestations on their farms and to provide recommendations that will lead to rapid adoptions of IPM measures and practices. And of course, IPM is short for Integrated Pest Management. Now, Integrated Pest Management is a pretty complicated system that involves the coordination of entire disciplines. So the task was not dissimilar to being asked to, in at most, two four-hour sessions with any one group, half of which was going to be taken up by translation, to convey all the skills necessary to be a good parent. So what I did was to develop a set of lesson plans, learning modules that covered the basics of integrated pest management incorporated into a set of PowerPoint presentations that I hope will ultimately be delivered by the host agency personnel. Those being the district extensionists or agricultural agents of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture or MOFA. I was immeasurably aided in this endeavor by Miriam Mills, the volunteer coordinator of IESC who acted as a liaison to hook me up with such folks as Emmanuel Adu Gayamfi, the Management Information Services Officer of MOFA, as well as Agricultural Extension Agents John Aveje and Christian Zonovele. These last were indispensable in providing translation services for the very brief taste 
of what I provided on site with each of the client groups in the form of a very truncated overview of integrated pest management and pesticide safety. In a nutshell, integrated pest management balances the ease and efficacy of the use of pesticides against their economic and environmental costs. It's a decision-making process that suppresses pests through planning and prevention, ID and information gathering, monitoring of pest populations, determining injury thresholds, using a combination of controls, and evaluating those controls. The first letters of these components form the mnemonic word PIMICE. So to illustrate on the theme suggested by this mnemonic, I will briefly give a rundown on how IPM can be used in the context of rodent control around the house. Planning and prevention on this front is largely conducted during the construction of the building whereby rodents are excluded from entry by ensuring that possible entry points are either screened off or protected by tight closures. It's important to know the species of rodent you're dealing with in order to ensure that you are dealing with them appropriately by using the right size traps or using appropriate amounts of rodenticide. And the various species can be identified by examination of their droppings or by the damage that they have caused. Once you identify what you're dealing with, then you can begin gathering information about the behavior and other biological characteristics of that particular beast. There's a lot of overlap in these concepts and the examination of damage and uh, collection of droppings might be considered part of monitoring. For instance, the elimination of brushy areas and other potential nesting sites and cleaning up compost areas might be considered prevention or could be considered an aspect of control. Even a single rodent in a household is sufficient to trigger action due to their potential to spread filth or even to cause fires by gnawing on wiring. A variety of traps can be utilized in combination with rodenticides, that is rat and mouse killing poisons, and care should be taken with any of these to ensure that they do not catch non-target birds or injure pets and children. The efficacy of traps can be determined simply by checking to see if they, when sprung, have caught anything. And rodenticide blocks can be checked to determine how much of the block has been eaten. Meanwhile, back in Ghana, I had determined that most of the participants had suffered at least some minor symptoms of exposure to pesticides following the use of their backpack sprayers. So we started our sessions with a crash course on pesticide first aid and the proper use of personal protective equipment. In each location, we included a demonstration of how to make a vest impermeable to pesticide leaks from the backpack sprayer from locally available trash bags. Although there was insufficient time to conduct a demonstration of how to make an organic pesticide from the leaves of the neem tree, I did bring in such a preparation made beforehand explained how it could be made essentially like any traditional herbal tea and then could be strained into an easily available empty water bottle. The addition of a few drops of liquid soap helps the solution to cover the breathing holes of the target insects. We did demonstrate in each location how 
A heated needle could be used to repeatedly puncture the cap of the water bottle to convert it into a convenient, easy to use pesticide applicator. It was emphasized that recycled drink containers should be used to hold only botanical pesticides made from low toxicity products such as neem or chili peppers. With each group, we also demonstrated how water bottles could be recycled to make traps for mango fruit flies for monitoring or control purposes. Dr. Maxwell Vila of MOFA provided me an orientation to this practice, which I will post as its own standalone video. Demonstrations on the construction of these traps was provided in all three of the communities. In addition to the traps used specifically to monitor fruit flies, we demonstrated with each group, again using recycled plastic, coated with petroleum jelly, could be used to make blue and yellow sticky traps to collect small insects such as aphids and white flies for monitoring purposes. In Dedesu and Amakrom, we conducted brief field forays to look for local pest insects and their natural enemies. This census taking turned up only a couple of different species. These brief field forays were supplemented with video presentations that focus primarily on identifying insect natural enemies, which to all appearances the growers found quite fascinating. An incident in Amakrom highlighted the need for proper identification for effective pest control. One of the farmers attending the training indicated that they were having problems with white fly in their cabbage. However, when we went out to the cabbage, there were no white flies to be seen. The growers caught a couple of the offending pests, and it turned out that what they had been talking about was not white fly, an aphid-like sucking insect, but instead was a white fly, uh, which was in fact not actually a fly at all, nor is white fly for that matter, but was instead a diamondback moth. Now, there are some management strategies that would be effective against both white fly and diamondback moth, but there are others, such as the use of VTK, a biological insecticide with very low mammalian toxicity and high e effectiveness against diamondback moth larvae that would be totally ineffective against whitefly. So it's important to know what you're dealing with. Well, that's pretty much a thumbnail synopsis of what was at most with translation and everything, a, the four hours that I had with uh, each community, and uh, which was itself just a very brief overview of the 40 hours or so of lesson plans that I prepared and left behind for a transmission by the district extensionists. USAID and IESC are involved in the development of food safety and traceability systems. Such systems can help to track pests and pesticides from their points of origin. A single quarantine pest can cause the rejection of an entire shipment of produce. However, at the point of production, the producer may not view these pests as problematic at all. Food traceability systems involve significant investments in infrastructure. I believe that a cost-sharing system to provide tablets or smartphones to rural producers would have significant impacts. Impacts that would affect food safety as well as improve production. District extensionists are already using tablets, and such technologies would assist even illiterate farmers to access extension information as well as record field observations. Photos taken with a smartphone can be used to replace note-taking for monitoring purposes. 
This is all the more important where there are literacy challenges. And a smartphone could even read text aloud that a producer might not otherwise be able to read him or herself. So in the best case scenario where a network exists, photos could be sent to a district extensionist and feedback and advice received in return. Something like, hey John, here's some insects that I found in my cabbage pad. To which John might reply, well, looks like you've got some cabbage aphid, but you have a bigger problem with some type of defoliator, probably cabbage looper or diamondback moth. I'm sending you a PDF document with IPM information about the problem. Have your text-to-speech emulator read it to you. Producers would then hear something like this. Diamondback larvae are small, about 0.33 inch when full grown, compared to other caterpillars in cold crops. The larval body is wider in the middle and tapering at both ends with two prolegs on the last segment. And similarly, they could have pesticide labels read to them by their phones. BTK biological insecticide. Directions for use. BTK biological insecticide is highly specific to some kinds of caterpillars. Smartphones are readily available in Ghana, and I myself purchased a low-end phone for about $100 US. A volume purchase made through the Grower Association and or cost sharing with one of the development agencies could bring the prices down to half that easily. Small children who can't read have been known to easily use certain tablet functions and I see no reason why producers couldn't become much more adept at using such technology. There are a large number of apps that could assist producers in insect identification as well as associated monitoring activities. Well, this video has gone on longer than I had originally anticipated already, so I, if I can figure out how to do it, will make available some associated videos to links here, here, and here. Jeez, I hope that worked. Thank you.